Hello, my name is Pip Mantis. I'm radiologist at the Royal Veterinary College, and this is a short presentation on how to go about reading radiographs. So, what you can do to improve from day one your film reading. I'm sure you heard it many times, but it's very, very important. You need to view radiographs in a quiet area where you can darken adequately. You know, holding the radiograph on your hand and try to see it on the ceiling light is not actually what I would describe an appropriate way to look at it and a lot of things will be missed. Even if you use a viewing box in an area that basically it's flooded with light, it wouldn't help much and you can miss details. It's understandable that in clinical setting it may be difficult to evaluate the radiograph there and then in a quiet area and in a darkened room because most of the consults in the room they end up being quite bright light for a reason, but you can always have a quick look there and explain to the owner at a later stage when things are a little bit quieter, you will be able to have a look at the radiograph in a more detail and then let them know if you found something more. When we look radiographs, we need at least two view boxes. We're going to use two orthogonal views. It's a three-dimensional world. We need two views to identify where whatever we see, structure or normality, is in a three-dimensional reality. Okay, and we need a bright light illuminator so we can see the darker areas of the radiograph. Nowadays, a lot of practices and universities, they have digital systems. So if that's the setting, two screens will be ideal. If you don't have two screens, you have one big screen, you can always use a split screen to display two views. It's always a good idea when you need an, or you see an organ on a lesion to evaluate it on both one view and the orthogonal. So you're getting your mind where is that in a three-dimensional setting. Also, ideally you want to use a high-definition computer screen. It's very important to set it properly. Otherwise, you may not see lesions, especially the subtler ones, like a small calculus in the urinary bladder or a hair-thin incomplete fracture, for example. It's very important for us to create three-dimensional structures and radiographs are flattographs. It's like taking a dog or a cat or whatever animal and when you take a lateral you just flatten it from side to side. So whatever you see could be anywhere from left to right. When you do a ventrodosal or a dorsal ventral you flatten it the other way around on the radiograph. So effectively it can be anywhere from dorsal to ventral. So you need both to decide how left or right a lesion is and how dorsal or ventral this is. And that means for thorax and abdomen, usually a lateral and a dorsoventral uh, or a ventrodorsal view. Usually for the abdomen, we do a ventrodorsal to avoid squeezing the abdominal organs. Always a good idea, and don't be ashamed of that. Use anatomy and radiology textbooks for reference. You see an area, you suspect there may be abnormal, but you are not exactly sure what is the normal appearance, actually. You can have an anatomy book like Arlene Coulson's or Donald Thrall's, if you like, radiographic anatomy book, and have a look to see how this looks normally. Actually, with practice, you can actually slowly gather normal radiographs and create your own normal anatomy reference bank. And don't be ashamed about that. We all occasionally forget how an anatomic area looks like, or sometimes the appearance looks too funky to be sure if it is normal or abnormal. Especially with musculoskeletal, it's always a good idea to compare the two sides to decide if something is abnormal. Usually the one is abnormal and the other is normal. Occasionally they may not both be abnormal. And of course, we can't expect to remember everything we've been taught in a vet school. So a radiology textbook will give us some information about what we see and how a particular disease we suspect may look radiographically or what radiographic signs we may see with that. So don't be ashamed to use anatomy and radiology textbooks. When we examine the radiograph, what I say to my students, and it's a very good advice I learned from my teacher, is always check the label. Never assume that all the radiographs are from the same animal, or, even more confusing, 
never assume all of the radiographs are from the same day and of course this goes when you didn't take the radiographs hopefully if you did you remember they are the same animal on the same date okay but when you receive radiographs or some friend asks you to have a look always check the label it's been many times that I got a radiograph that was either for multiple animals multiple dogs or multiple uh, cats usually it's more confusing with dogs it seems like to my experience and uh, basically especially if the animal is the same size more or less it can be quite confusing also check the date you know seeing a series of radiographs that you assume they are the same date while they may have been taken at different time periods that will really affect your uh, interpretation of the findings number two make sure you identify the right and left side clearly and i had this question many times can i not say what's the right side or the left side from the abdomen or the thorax there are some tips that will help you identify the right and left side from the thorax of course you can understand for as far as the legs are concerned either it's a right or a left side it wouldn't look much different unless you put a sign in it okay but for thorax and abdomens we have some uh, actually tips that we can identify the right, right on left side but even then you want to put the correct mark on the radiograph why if for nothing else there is a condition called situs inversus when effectively what happens all the organs are on the other side so whatever is normally left or in the majority of the animals left it's on the right on that particular animal with situs inversus the animal is normal except everything is like a mirror image and the only way to diagnose that is if you have the right or the left marker correctly set on the radiograph otherwise you can read about the tips and use them and you will just flip the radiograph thinking they just put it the wrong way around number three extremely important in our dire age take good quality radiographs especially with the digital systems out there people tend to rely to computers too much as i like to say they think okay if i don't take it that well if i don't have such a good exposure such a good position i can correct it radiographically I can tell you from experience and without a doubt you cannot correct a jumping dog or cat off the table you know a moving animal you cannot you may be able to play a little bit with the exposure and try to improve some areas but you will never make a not good quality radiograph not nicely positioned you will not be able to make it properly and a good quality radiograph just by playing on the computer so the more attention to detail you pay when you position the animal and take the radiograph, the better your radiographs will be and the more abnormalities you will be able to identify in the long run. Now that we know the basics, let's go about how to read radiographs. Okay, and I will say that there is only one rule when you're going to read radiographs. And the rule says examine the entire radiograph that means if you look at the thorax make sure you check the skeletal structures that they are in the radiograph maybe the cranial abdomen including over there subcutaneous tissues legs whatever is included not just inside the thorax same goes for the abdomen make sure you don't just examine inside the abdomen check the caudal thorax if it is there the skeletal structures whatever else is in the radiograph maybe the pelvis maybe the urethra and the osphenis in the radiograph check that also for musculoskeletal it usually means don't forget to check the soft tissues usually with musculoskeletal we check the bones what we forget to check is the soft tissues so we have to make an effort to check that and actually we could have easily finished the whole presentation here but just say check the whole radiograph now you will say wait a minute there are too many things to check how am i going to actually do that we'll come to that but first of all why do we need to check the whole radiograph one we cannot always predict the lesions plain based on the clinical signs for example you may have a 
dog with lethargy. Does this guide you to a particular sign? Not really. Some lesions are suggested by the history. For example, they could feel a lump in the abdomen. Others are unexpected. You know, the animal was out, you know, came out, it didn't look well, but we don't know what happens. Or you have the classic case of RTA or traffic accident or any other kind of trauma. There is no way you will be able to predict what you're going to find in a trauma. So in those cases, and for these reasons, you have to check the whole radiographs. In every case, you have to check the whole radiograph, and that's what I will give you some advice later on, on how to go about checking the whole radiograph. What I usually recommend to my students is follow a systematic method. Examine all parts of the film actively. And I will explain a little bit later what I mean by that. But how many of us we had this experience, or maybe we were the people that sitting on the corridor, looking at the radiograph, not figuring out anything, somebody passes through and goes, that's a nice mass. And then we spent half an hour trying to figure out why we didn't see the obvious lesions that was in front of us. And the answer I've come with is we did not actively look in. We were gazing at the radiograph, trying to see if something jumps out. You know, it would be nice if the lesions, they came with a sign saying, here I am. Unfortunately, a lot of them, they are not. So we need to come in a way to actually make sure we actively examine, we don't just gaze. When we find an abnormality, and that's the second point, we need to localize it to a specific anatomic structure. Sometimes it's easy. You can say that's lung, for example, or that's liver. Sometimes you are not sure. You don't have to just put one structure. If you think there is a possibility for more than one organ or structure, just state and localize it as much as possible. And at the end, arrive at an appropriately specific diagnosis. And when we say that, most people think I will take a radiograph and get a diagnosis. The reality of the matter is you are not going to get a diagnosis as one disease in most radiographs. In some you will, for example, you will have a mega esophagus, maybe with aspiration, pneumonia, without, but in a lot of cases you will have to have two or three differential diagnoses that they are possible, and then you have to put them in order of more likely to least likely. Okay, so we need to actively examine, try to localize as much as possible, and try to arrive at an appropriate diagnosis. Before the system, two very important things. Very basic, but what we usually mess up are the basic. When we look at radios and we find an abnormality or something that looks funky or something that is abnormal or something we are not sure if it is normal or abnormal, it just strikes out as odd. Then we stop and we need to describe it using the radiographic signs. Number, size, shape, location, margination, radiopacity. Why? We need to give our brain specifics to come up with the answer. Simple as that. And what's the difference? Let's say I tell you there is an opacity in the cranial abdomen. How many differentials can you think? Take a second. Chances are, you can think tens, hundreds, you know, you can basically take a, a, a medicine book and find a disease on its page, more or less, that can become a diagnosis with an opacity in the cranial abdomen. Now, let's specify that. We have one, two centimeters in diameter, rounded, soft tissue opacity, well marginated, in the left caudal liver lobe. How many differences can you think now? Now it's specific, it's rounded, it's marginated, it's in that location. Yes, we can think one thing, for example, it could be a nodule, it could be a cyst, it could be an abscess, it could be an hematoma, but we specify our thinking in one particular area. Suddenly, just by giving this detailed information to your brain, 
our differential list narrowed immediately. So the more specific details you give to your brain, the more answers you're going to get. And that's why every time something looks odd to you, make sure you use the radiographic signs to describe all of them. Number, size, shape, location, margination, radiopacity. One other little detail that we do often, we, we are doing erroneously often. So when we say opacity, we need to be specific. Try to avoid just saying opaque. Because just saying opaque is like I saw a car with a color on the M25, for example. I'm not telling you anything. Be specific. What color? The same with the opacities. And from more lucent to more opaque, it is gas, fat, soft tissue. In soft tissue, fluid is included. Because some people, for some reason, I would not understand, they think fluid is a different opacity. Fluid is soft tissue opacity. Bone and mineral. So again, from lucent to opaque, we have gas, fat, soft tissue, bone and mineral. And we can see all those opacities in every radiograph we have. Especially of the thorax and abdomen. Easy. And you will say, what about the mineral? Usually it's the unexposed part or the marker, the left or right marker we have on that could be mineral. So it would be a good exercise for you. Take a thoracic radiograph and try to identify each of those opacities. Gas, fat, soft tissue, bone, and mineral. Okay, so be specific. When we go to the radiographic abnormalities and we come to the area of the opacity, don't just say opacity, say if it is gas, fat, soft tissue, bone, or mineral. And now I'll finish up giving what I would recommend. So when you take a film, thoracic, abdominal, musculoskeletal, identify organ by organ. You don't have to do that, as we said in the beginning. You can just look at the whole radiograph, however it suits you. But when you do it organ by organ, two things happen. One, you concentrate on the organs, on each organ individually, if you like, and then you have more chances to see an abnormality. Okay, so you examine each organ individually and you make sure you check also organs that may not be visible. What does this mean? In every radiograph, thorax and abdomen, we may have organs that we see, we may have organs that sometimes we partially see, and we have organs that we normally should not see. So make a list, however it suits you, to go through these organs, you know, organ by organ, in whatever order you prefer. You want to go from the head to the tail, top to bottom, zigzag, in circles, you know, however you like, as long as when you finish, you have checked every possible organ. And some people will say, what is wrong about an area? For example, cranial thorax. Cranial thorax has a lot of organs. And though I know all the talking about multitasking, I don't think we can do it as human beings. Okay, I think it's much easier to spot a lesion in an organ than in a whole area. So go organ by organ would be my advice. Remember, you don't have to do it. You just have to look at the whole radiograph however it suits you. Now, step number two, identify the visual features. Whatever something looks odd, abnormal, possibly abnormal, honestly, I don't have a clue, but it looks funky, stop and go through the radiographic signs. Number size, shape, location, margination, and radiopacity. And as we said, when you go to radiopacity, make sure you be specific. What radiopacity? From most lucent, lucency, gas, fat, soft tissue, bone, and mineral. Then, when we identify all the features, 
think what would be the structural change. For example, why this lung lobe looks increase of tissue opacity. And usually it boils down to cells or fluid. For example, in the lung lobe example, you know, air has left the building and has been replaced by either cells, fluid, or a combination. Immediately, when you know what structurally has happened, you can lead to the type of pathology, which will be step number four. For example, fluids in the lung. What fluids do we know? Hemorrhage, you know, pus, edema fluid, or what cells? Inflammatory, neoplastic. So that would be the type of pathology. And then we go to the differential diagnosis. And immediately you have your first quite long differential diagnosis. For example, in our example, if it was hemorrhage, it would be a pulmonary hemorrhage. If it was edema, it would be pulmonary edema. If it was pus, it would be an abscess. If it is inflammatory cells, it would be pneumonia. And if it is neoplastic cells, it would be neoplasia. And that would be our long first differential diagnosis. Then we combine with the clinical data and become a little bit of a gambler. Let's say it was one lung lobe, and that lung lobe was just ventrally. So edema usually is not one lung lobe. Abscess may look rounded, not can be, but if the lung lobe is the normal shape, it doesn't feel like abscess. Hemorrhage can still be if we also have evidence of trauma. Pneumonia can definitely be. Neoplasia can definitely be in one lung lobe being affected. So, let's see, if that was a German Shepherd, six months old, with coughing and fever, chances are, if I ask you, most of you will go to pneumonia. Why? German Shepherds, six months old, they don't get tumors? Yeah, but what are the odds? So we are gambling a little bit, not much, based on what is most likely. So for a six-month-old German Shepherd, in our example, pneumonia would have been most likely, neoplasia would have been less likely. If I change that and say that was a German Shepherd, 10 years old, and let's put the ice on the cake here. Let's say this German Shepherd also has something that feels like a mass in the abdomen. How many of you now would go that most likely neoplasia, less likely pneumonia? Anything changed? the age of the animal, other findings that make something more to less likely. So when we come to the stage to combine with the clinical data, we put the diagnosis in order of most likely to least likely. Occasionally we'll be lucky, it will be only one intestinal foreign body obstruction, mega esophagus aspiration pneumonia. Sometimes it will not, so we have to put most likely to least likely. And then, what are we going to do next? What's the next best thing? What's the thing I can do that will either exclude the majority of my differentials, or actually will come and tell me, that's your diagnosis. So, let's recoup. First of all, when you go examine the whole body. How you do it, totally up to you. What I would recommend is you do it organ by organ. When you find an abnormality or something or anything that you don't think you can just exclude as normal, stop and describe it in detail. Number, size, shape, location, margination, and radiopacity. And when you come to radiopacity, avoid cyanopate. Be specific. Gas, fat, soft tissue, bone, or mineral. Okay, we said fluid is soft tissue. So I hope all of you who listen to that now, you're not going to say fluid opacity, you can say soft tissue opacity. Then think structurally, what has changed? And usually it boils down to fluids or cells or a combination of the two. That will lead you to the type of pathology and that will allow you to make your first differential diagnosis. Now you think, what do I have in front of me? What animal? What sex? What's the clinical finding? What's the history? And then I put my diagnosis from most to least likely. I will exclude some, but may end up with more than one. If I end up with more than one, I am thinking from most likely to least likely. And then what's next? What's the next step that will either give me the diagnosis or exclude the majority of what I am thinking? 
Thank you for your time. I hope you have found this uh, little uh, video 